Okay, so let me resume the class. So we are looking to solve, or to calculate the partition function of this uh, six vertex model. And we do it by considering one row at a time and by studying the object called the transfer matrix, which gives you the transition probability between one uh, given configuration uh, to the next. So if the partition function can be written as uh, the sum of the allow configuration times uh, the, um, for the weights of the different vertices that you can have, you can do the same uh, for the transfer matrix, but that does not really add uh, anything. Okay, you reduced the number of configurations that you have to consider, but it's still uh, an exponential number. But now the idea is that, okay, I already chopped the problem once by considering row by row, why don't to, to chop it uh, further and consider it one vertex at a time. So the same way as we consider the whole system as made out of row, let's consider the row made out of individual process in which a configuration is connected to the next one. Here, this does not have a natural interpretation of a transmission because there is not uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between these states and, and that state, but you can still think it as a, pro as a process in which the, you can, with which you can construct uh, the transfer matrix. So we introduce the L operator, which has uh, four indices and which represents the vertex which tells you, given a configuration of uh, arrows on, on the horizontal and the vertical direction, what is the weight. So this can be written as a matrix in a natural basis. And this is A, B, C, C, B, A, with all other elements being, uh, being zero. So depending on the value of these indices, you have these weights, which gives you what are the six non, uh, six admissible vertices in your system. And so you can think that you can construct this transfer matrix by uh, uh, chaining different L uh, operator and by making matrix uh, product contraction on the horizontal line because two successive L operators share one horizontal uh, vertex. And therefore, you can write this as a sum over the alpha one, sum of the two value of the alpha two times alpha n minus n one, uh, alpha n. So this is a this one, sorry. Times L alpha one gamma one alpha two gamma one prime L, L alpha two gamma two alpha three gamma two prime, so on and so forth until the last one. Gamma n alpha one gamma n prime, which is a sort of a matrix uh, multiplication rule if uh, you consider this not as a four-dimensional object, but a two-by-two-dimensional uh, matrix with elements acting on the vertical space. But we'll get back to that in a little while. And okay, so this is pretty much where you stop if you don't have integrability. So if you have integrability, what do you do? Well, you stare at this and you say, I don't know how to solve this model. And then you are Baxter and say, since I don't know how to solve this model, let me try to solve a bunch of models at the same time. One, solving one model seems a hopeless task. Let's solve n of them at the same time. Maybe. I learned something in that way. 
And it is like you are staring at a complicated transcendental equation. You don't know how to solve it. Okay, you invent n of them coupled, and maybe you find it. That seems like a crazy idea, but in reality, uh, what that gives you is an algebra. So it tells you that there is a structure behind it, and then you can use that structure to solve the model that you wanted to start with. So uh, Baxter's uh, idea was, let him introduce a second model, which is very similar to this one, but with different weights, alpha prime, uh, a prime, b prime, and c prime. So still a sex vertex model, but with different weights. And with that, I construct a prime transfer matrix and a prime L operators using these weights. And Baxter question is under which condition t, t prime is equal to t prime t. So the idea is you take two rows of the two models, so you take one configuration, the t evolves it in a different configuration, then you evolve this configuration with the t prime, and keeping fixed the first and last configuration, what are the probability that this is the same as first evolving it with t prime and then evolving it with t. So it's a commutativity process, and in spirit it means uh, that then you can start uh, playing uh, tricks, and it means that the two evolutions can be composed. <clears throat> um, so to answer uh, this uh, question, it is you construct this, you consider this object as a whole, and this object as a whole, both of them you can construct out of the L matrix. And again, to, I think that to explain it well, I will have to write tons of indices, which then might confuse it, might confuse you. So the answer is that if I consider an element of this, so this is L and this is L prime. So here you have gamma, here you have gamma prime, you have gamma double prime, alpha, alpha prime, beta, beta prime. You want to know, and if you have a matrix, which we call R, which does this surface on this service, so let me see that. I put it. Yeah. Alpha prime and beta prime. And there is a matrix R, so that this object is the same as this one. Alpha, beta, R, um, beta and double prime, alpha and double prime. This is gamma. This is gamma prime, this is gamma double prime, this is alpha double prime, and this is beta double prime, but here we use L, and here use L prime. So in matrix notation, if you have L, L prime, R equal to R, L prime, L, then since the transfer matrix, and this double row transfer matrix in particular, is constructed by a product of L, L prime that you want to exchange. This operator does exactly this trick. So the idea is I start from, from this configuration. I add my R matrix, then this by that relation is equal to so this was 
L prime, L, this is R, this is still L prime and L, but here instead you got L and L prime. And then you keep bringing this R further and further, so that eventually you arrive at this uh, configuration in which L has been on top and L prime has been on top. Now, what you want to do is, at this point, to get a transfer matrix, you have to connect this horizontal spin with this one. So this alpha double prime has to, be, to go to alpha, and this beta double prime has to go to beta, which means that you contract pain. So, um, yeah, I, now I realize that I made a slight mistake. I should have introduced first this matrix, which is called monodromy matrix, which is the product of the L, like the transfer matrix, but without closing uh, the periodic boundary condition in the X direction. So this is alpha prime, alpha one, gamma one, alpha two, gamma one prime, alpha two, gamma two, alpha three, gamma two prime, alpha uh, uh, n, gamma n, alpha n plus one, gamma n prime. So this object has an additional degrees of freedom, which is uh, the, f the initial and final uh, horizontal spin. So these two objects that I have here are tau, tau prime r equal to r tau prime tau. This is the representation of this quantity. It is clear that once I trace over the horizontal degrees of freedom the monotony matrix, I get the transfer matrix. And therefore, if I trace this object due to the cyclic property of the trace, I get that t, t prime is equal to t prime t. Another way is that this is equivalent to r minus 1 t, t prime equal to t prime t. And then you can take the trace. So finding two six vertex models with different uh, weights which commute is equivalent to ask the question of whether there is such matrix R that does this uh, service. So now you look at this object. You have a four by four matrices contracted in a, a funny way because you see that you have that the vertical degrees of freedom are not contracted, you only contract the horizontal degrees of freedom, and essentially you have um, one, two, three degrees of freedom for each. So this is a, an equation, a matrix equation, that when you spell it out in terms of uh, equation, uh, in terms of sing, as a system, uh, spells out 64 equations. And you have that uh, three variables, uh, three parameters are given by the L matrix. And you have additional three uh, that, you, that are parameters that you can vary that are given by the L prime matrix. And then you have the additional parameter of the R matrix. Now, the ICE rule is essentially a conservation rule for the total magnetization. Because the fact that you have two rows coming in and two rows uh, coming out means that you have a total conservation of uh, the magnetization. So, which means that it's not likely that you're going to find a solution to this equation in a space where R does not, uh, does not have the same symmetry. So it's natural.
I'm saying that if you find that uh, you, had, you can find an L prime and an R such that this is satisfied, then you have found another model which commutes with the original one. But the question is, can you do that? And typically, you cannot. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So typically, for generic model, this question is pointless. You can, will never be able to find this generically, because as I said, so as I was going to say, it's natural that R has the same structure of the L matrix. So you have 64 equations in three variables and six parameters. And typically, these are over-constrained uh, system that has no solutions. But instead, in this case, it has a solution. So most of all, a lot of equations are actually zero because a lot of uh, elements in this matrix are zero. So okay, that is fine. But that uh, comes the 64 equation to 20. Then okay, you can use uh, some symmetry because here again you have some symmetry in these three parameters to go from this 20 to to 10. But that is still killing you uh, if there was no integrability. But then you notice additional symmetries. And at the end, you're able to get just three simple equations out of this, um, this big set. And these equations are A, C prime, A double prime, equal to B, C prime, B double prime, B C, A prime, C double prime, A, B prime, C double prime, equal to B, A prime, C double prime, plus C, C prime, B double prime, C, B prime, A double prime, C, A prime, B double prime, plus B, C prime, C double prime. And so these is both the origin and the explanation of integrability. You ask a very strong requirement, crazy at first. And again, if you have Mathematica, you can plug this and find out if it has solution. But if you don't have Mathematica and you are in the 60s and you write this 64 by six, uh, 64 equation, this 8 by 8 uh, matrix, and you want to try to, uh, to equate it, well, be careful not make, any, to not make any simple algebra mistake to find the, the solution. And kudos to people who had the, the, the vision and the gut uh, to, to do it. And there you have. You have this three equation. So you look at them, and uh, the first thing that you notice is that they are homogeneous. In all these terms, you have one and prime, one, and, uh, one prime, and one double prime terms, which means that any scaling of the uh, uh, parameter by an overall multiplicative factor will leave uh, the solution unchanged. So you can normalize your L matrix the way you want which means that out of the three parameters, only two are really free. The other is just an overall uh, rescaling. Uh, the other thing is that what you're really interested in is uh, to find what is the prime system that commutes with the unprime one. So you can use this equation to eliminate the double prime variables. In doing so, you get that a, a squared plus b squared minus c squared divided by 2ab has to be equal to a prime square plus b prime square minus c prime square equal to 2a prime b prime. So by eliminating the double prime, you find that if my original system and my prime system, uh, I can construct this quantity which is equal to the same quantity for the other, then these two systems commute. So this is normally denoted by delta. And it is the delta of the xxz uh, chain, as it will turn out. 
So, which means that out of these two parameters that you still have uh, free, because as you say, all the, all the formulas are homogeneous, so a rescaling does not uh, matter, uh, this fixes one parameter to be common between these two equations. So, it is convenient to parameterize this A, B, and C in a way that makes this clear. So, one option is, of course, A equal to A, uh, B, which is the normalization factor, A equal to AX, which is the variable, and C equal to A, square root of 1 minus 2 delta X plus X squared, which, when plugged here, gives you delta, but this is a not very convenient parameterization, you have this uh, square root, branch cuts, so uh, you prefer a clever one. And there are several which are more or less equivalent. The one that I will use is one in terms of uh, uh, tri uh, <laughs> of these functions. Rho, which is the overall um, Normalization, lambda plus phi, B equal to rho sin h lambda, and C equal to rho hyperbolic uh, sine of phi, which, when plugged here, tells you that delta is equal to cosh phi. And if delta is lesser than 1, you analytically continue uh, phi uh, to, to be an imaginary uh, variable. And so you see that if you choose two systems that with two six vertex model with parameter a, b, and c, which have the same value of phi but different value of lambda, they are by construction uh, commuting. Then you can also wonder what is the form of the R matrix. Well, the R matrix is, has the same shape. Uh, here, all variables are the same, so it is also clear that the R matrix will also have to have the same invariant. The same invariant. So you can also parameterize the R matrix through the same uh, structure. Uh, so you go back here, you use the other equations, you find, again, out of these two comes from using two of these equations, which tells you that also the R matrix will have the same phi value. Then you use two out of three equations. The last one uh, is used to tell you that lambda double prime has to be equal to lambda prime minus lambda which means that you can write, instead of L and L prime, you can write L of lambda. And that equation means that L lambda times L lambda prime is equal to R lambda prime minus lambda, which is R lambda prime minus lambda L lambda prime L lambda. So, the way we constructed this equation is satisfied. And what is this equation? Hmm? It's a Young-Buster equation. Not truly. It's a version of the Young-Buster equation. Because uh, these two operators act on different spaces. The, while the R matrix is an operator acting purely on the horizontal um, degree of freedom. The L matrix instead acts on both in the horizontal and on the vertical degrees of freedom. So, how do I say this now? I'll say it in a while. Yes, maybe but I go. I still have some blackboard. 
So, armed with this, we can construct the monotony operator by multiplying all this L together, so that you have that tau of lambda, tau of lambda prime, R lambda prime minus lambda is equal to R of lambda prime minus lambda, tau of lambda prime, tau of lambda. And finally, you can take the trace of this and you write your transfer matrix and you find that transfer matrices with different value of the spectral parameter, which is how we called this variable commute. So you set out to solve a model with a particular choice of A, B, C, and D, and to calculate uh, the partition function. And what you have found out is that instead, it was better to consider that model part of a family, parameterized by a parameter lambda, which runs into a curve. So your particular choice of A, B, and C were a particular choice of lambda. But in reality, that model commutes with a continuous. So not only you have found one additional model which commutes, but you have found infinite many. You can find a continuous of other models which, uh, which commute. So this was the crazy idea of Baxter, which uh, gave rise to this structure. Because out of that, it means that anything you can construct using this uh, lambda will commute by construction, which means that you can expand this transfer matrix in powers of lambda, or as it is customary, you can expand the logarithm of the transfer matrix in powers of lambda. And each term of this expansion is another 2n 2N by 2n matrix, which commute with the original uh, transfer matrix. So this tells, gives you immediately that you have a large number of conserved charges. And here we are in the classical uh, regime. So here the, trans the conserved charges have a definite meaning because you have uh, knowledge of what is classical integrability and you have that you can have as many conserved charges as you need and therefore that your model is integrable in this sense. But there is, and in particular, you find that as you expand your transfer matrix around lambda equal to zero. So this gives you a formal expansion in uh, lambda n. You find that j zero is equal to rho n sinh to the power n of phi e to the i p, where p is the lattice momentum. So it's the operator that shifts your um, system by one lattice site. It's a very easy and uh, and beautiful proof, but I don't have time uh, to stop uh, for it. But most of all, you find that the first charge after this is proportional to the Hamiltonian of the XXZ model well, plus the momentum. Actually, sorry, I made a mistake because here I'm already writing the logarithm. So this is n uh, log of rho sinh phi i p. And so you see that among the conserved charges of this model, there is a matrix that has the same functional form as the Hamiltonian of the XXZ uh, uh, system uh, model written in matrix form. 
So it tells you that if you use the matrix representation uh, for your quantum problem, and if you are solving the transfer matrix of this classical problem, then the eigenstates of the transfer matrix are also eigenstate of your uh, XXZ Hamiltonian. So that solving one is equivalent to solving the other. And this to me is, should come as a, not as a surprise because you have heard this uh, statement before, but is a profound fact. So again, because of time, I cannot complete my promise of solving this model, uh, namely to extract the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. Needless to say that the process involves uh, satisfying some conditions, which can be written as the beta equations, and this gives rise uh, to something similar um, to the beta process, and that. Uh, the ground state of the six vertex model of the um, sorry of the XXZ chain corresponds to the most probable state with the largest eigenvalue of this uh, transfer matrix. If you want the details, you can find them uh, in the notes. I want to use this machinery to justify the algebraic Bethe-Ansatz. But before I leave, I said I want to complete with the statement that I said that this is a form of the Yam Buster, but it's not the true Ian Buster. The true Ian Buster, you find when you ask the question, okay, so T and T, uh, and T prime, T lambda, and commute. But what if I consider T lambda, T lambda prime, and T lambda double prime? So pairwise, they all commute. But am I assured that uh, taking this uh, product, I don't get a different answer uh, depending on whether I commute first the first two and then the second or, or vice versa. So you want uh, to check uh, this. So you introduce the R matrix, and this gives a non-trivial uh, constraint, which is in this case is satisfied on the R matrix. which is that the R matrix themselves satisfy a young buster equation. And this is the true Jan Baxter that you have seen several times. So this is essentially an algebra. This is giving you an algebra a relation between the different R matrix in their joint representation. Because the structure constant of the algebra, which are uh, this object which connects how you commute uh, the ones are still given in terms of uh, the operators themselves. Well, this is direct one of the direct representation where you have this structure function for the algebra telling you how do you commute the R and R prime. So this is a generalized algebra, and so the fundamental of the, the representation is the one that gives you the Yam buster, which is the adjoint, and this is uh, the one that follows. So the way that you go about constructing a Hild uh, an integrable model is, okay, here we were lucky, so we started from the six vertex model, and it turned out to be integrable. You can uh, do something else, and then you might lose uh, one year or no, finding, trying to find an R matrix that uh, does this job without really knowing if that can be done or not. So the way to do it is this, const so this was a constructive approach, but it works when the model is integrable. What you instead normally do is that you find solution or representation for your uh, Young Buster equations. 
uh, by considering the R matrix acting on different uh, spaces. Here it acts on two copies of the same two-dimensional uh, space. You can use three-dimensional, four-dimensional, something like that. Uh, this uh, has a symmetry that is um, uh, uh, conservation of uh, the arrows. You can try to change uh, this symmetry. So you impose some symmetry constraint and some space, and then you look uh, for uh, if you have a solution. And when you find such solution, you have your R matrix, and at that point, you know that you're also going to be able to satisfy this uh, young, uh, other young buster equation, maybe more than one uh, uh, way, because although here all these matrices are four by four matrix, uh, they act on different spaces. So the L matrix can actually be rectangular because it acts on the horizontal and the vertical space. And you might have that, you know, the vertical spins might be in the spin one representation where you can take three values instead of uh, two. So for each solution of the true Yam Buster, you can find different representation for uh, the solution of this, which gives rise to different L, L operators. Then you can construct the monodromy matrix by multiplying this L operator, which is not by no means an easy uh, task from an algebraic point of view, but it is only long. By construction, you have that this L operator, this monodromy matrix, give you a family of commuting transfer matrix, which are ipso facto integrable. And then you expand your integrable, uh, your transfer matrix, and you find what models you have. And in particular, from the second charge, you find the Hamiltonian of the quantum model that you solved. So this is the inverse process. It's hard to come up with a good definition of what is an integrable model, a bit of an integrable model. It's hard if, I, if a friend of yours uh, come with a strange Hamiltonian that you never saw before and ask you, oh, is this Hamiltonian integrable? It's very hard to answer this question. But if instead somebody comes to you with a solution of the Young Buster, then you ask him for one day, one week, a month, you know, depending on how quick you are in doing calculation, and you come back with a bunch of Hamiltonians which are integrables and which are more or less local depending on your, uh, on your taste. And so while this is the way to go about it, so first the ambassador and then the integrable model, the other way to me it's like uh, calculating integrals versus derivative. So you don't, if I ask you to calculate an integral and you never saw a derivative, I cannot give you instruction on how to, how to do it. So you only learn how to calculate integral because you have calculated enough derivatives. And then uh, you have been given some tricks to work out uh, integrals. And then you stare at it. You try to see if you see some pattern. You do these uh, tricks. But you never know if you have been good enough, if you cannot find the solution in terms of uh, uh, fun, a simple function, elementary function, or if you cannot find it in a table, you never know if you're not good enough to see the right change of variables, the right trick, or uh, if instead it's just because it cannot be uh, computed. So here is the same thing. You solve enough models through the young buster, you develop the feeling of how things work, and then if somebody comes to you with a Hamiltonian, then you might look, okay, this has these conserved quantities, this has this symmetry, okay, so let me try uh, to work backwards and guess what will be the R, the R matrix that does it, and maybe you are lucky and you're good. Otherwise, you're a bit dead in the water. So, how do we use this to construct, to, so, to solve the XXZ model? First, I should, Fabian would tell me that I should stop now and ask if there are questions. As we heard yesterday, uh, that is a very important uh, requirement because you want uh, them to live on a curve. Um, now, in reality, you can have situations in which this is not the case, but typically that is because you're not using the right variables. So if you find such solution, most likely there is a change of variables that brings it into a different form. Although, 
Yeah, maybe Manas knows. I know that in the anti-symmetric exclusion uh, process, uh, it can be mapped into the an XX uh, Z chain in which the transfer matrix, uh, in which the beta equations cannot be formed into a difference form. So I do not know uh, the in the algebraic version if where does this uh, break. So I know that there are some integrable models that come out uh, from stochastic uh, evolutions in which this property of translational invariance is lost, but I don't know exactly at which point. I think that for the transfer matrix and for the R matrix, it should be there. I think that it is probably when you enter at the level of the L matrix that this is broken. But if somebody knows the answer, please speak out. I'm saying in this case that for each fixed values of the external legs, gamma and gamma prime, mm -hmm. it was a single four by four matrix equality. No, there are two because you also have two horizontal legs. So, I mean, I, I was quick, uh, but in reality, what you, that you, as you suggested, you freeze the, the vertical uh, degrees of freedom and you only consider the horizontal one. But so in that space, is still a four by four. Yeah, yeah, but it's a single four by four matrix equation, right? Like, oh, but this is exactly the case. R equals R times something else. And the question is whether there exists an R that solves. I don't, you, you, this is the minimal representation uh, you, you can have. So, and of course, like, this is in another comment I wanted to make, even though it's probably going to fall uh, flat on you, um, is that uh, integrability is connected with many beautiful subjects in uh, mathematics. Uh, one that I want to mention is the concept of a quantum group, which is not as exoteric as uh, the name uh, implies. It's just a, ge a, a, a generalization of the standard Lie group, um, if you want. And the reason for which it is uh, connected is because there is always a trivial solution of the young buster equation every time you specify the space and the symmetry uh, that you want, which is the exchange uh, operator. Like for the uh, spin model, you know, sigma x, sigma dot sigma uh, plus a half uh, plus one gives you the exchange operator. So there is, this is always a solution of the young buster um, equation. And the uh, quantum group gives you a way to deform this exchange uh, operator, which from the point of view of the deformation remains an exchange operator, but in terms of the original algebra instead becomes something else. And so this is a way to construct generic representation of the R matrix. So you don't have to go around and go and thinking that, okay, I'm taking the eight by eight dimensional uh, space and I, so then I look for the Jan Buster equation for this million, no, a thousand component matrix, and by brute force, I look uh, for a solution. There is a more elegant way. It requires more or less you at the same time in learning the quantum groups, but then you solve all the other uh, system at once because you have a constructive way to uh, generate more uh, integrable models. But this is just a quick remark. So let me try to give you a glimpse of the... Um, algebraic approach. So I think that what I want to tell, what is, I think, important to keep in mind as a reference, is that say that I have a one-dimensional uh, spin chain, and I want to construct the, the typical scattering matrix uh, that I have of two, uh, two spins. So here I consider two spins on um, neighboring sites or in two, two sites. So this has a natural four by four um, structure given by the, the two states that each of the two spins uh, can have incoming and outgoing so that I can write this and I put a small r as some um, um, overall amplitude times one r T, T, R, 1, where R and T are the reflection and transmission uh, coefficient. 
Now, there is a subtlety which I don't want to spend too much time uh, discussing, but it has to do with the identity of the particle so that you can also consider a different uh, transfer matrix in which R and T are exchanged. And these two matrices are related by the important exchange matrix, which I mentioned before, and which has the natural uh, interpretation in terms of sigma matrices as, uh, as such. So there is a natural interpretation for the, both the R and the L operator as uh, scattering matrices of a pair of uh, spin inside it. But uh, while the R matrix gives you the scattering between uh, spin living in the X, in the horizontal direction, the L matrix in encodes the, the scattering between one spin in the vertical and one spin in the horizontal scattering off. So they act in different space. So the typical uh, approach to solve uh, integrable models, this is true for the case we already see, it's going to be true for the algebraic beta answer, but it's also true uh, for the inverse scattering method, is to enlarge your physical space by introducing some additional degree of freedom that is not physical, in a sense, because the addition of this additional uh, degree of freedom allows you to decouple the interaction of the physical ones, because you make the physical degrees of freedom interact with, uh, with this extra one. So in spirit, you are thinking that in this way you are decoupling the dynamics so that you are making the problem, in a sense, free, so that then you can evolve it, and then eventually you trace out this additional degree of freedom that you insert uh, to get uh, the interacting uh, dynamics. This is a vague analogy in general, but to me it helps uh, to, uh, to understand what's going on. So here what I want to solve is the XXZ chain. And in this case, I want to calculate the eigenstates in, uh, for the spin variables, which in my six vertex model, uh, language are the vertical degrees of freedom. So these vertical degrees of freedom, which are the physical spin of the chain, I add an additional degree of freedom, which is the horizontal degree of freedom of the six vertex model, which is not physical. But I add it to mediate the interaction between uh, the, uh, the physical spin. So, I so I take advantage of the fact that uh, the transfer matrix commutes with the Hamiltonian by shifting my strategy from what it was for the coordinate beta ansatz, which was to find eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, to the strategy now is going to be to find the eigenstates of the transfer matrix. Because if I find the eigenstate of the transfer matrix, being commuted with the Hamiltonian, I also find the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So I want to construct a transfer matrix in the quantum sense, which was expansion gives me the Hamiltonian I'm interested in. And to do that, I pass to adding this additional degree of freedom. So I start from this additional degree of freedom, which I call an ancilla. And I look for the solution of the young buster equation in this space. So I use these additional degrees of freedom V, and I look for an operator which acts on two copies of V. And I typically use A, B, and C to uh, denote different copies of uh, this ancillary uh, space. And in, th in, my, in the case of the six vertex model, the dimension of V is going to be two, and that will be the same as the dimension of the Hilbert space, but this is an accident. And in general, I will have to look for it, but we just solved the six vertex model. So I just used 
what I find, what I found, and I write R A B lambda as some amplitude A one plus tau A Z tau B Z over two plus B lambda one minus tau A Z tau B Z over two plus C lambda tau A plus tau B minus plus tau A minus tau B plus. Where, again, for clarity, I use tau to represent the poly matrices acting on the ciliary space, while sigma will be uh, denoting the poly matrices acting on the physical space when I have it. And as you see, this uh, structure reproduces this uh, scattering matrix, which is the same one that we have been using so far, but now, in light of the fact that I want to uh, do an algebraic approach, I use uh, the poly matrix and their algebra to do it. Uh, where A, B, and C are essentially the ones that I gave uh, before. Let, let me skip uh, the details. Then I'm looking for an L operator, a lax operator. So this acts on A and B, this acts on J, A and J, which acts on the J if Hilbert space and the A if uh, ancillary space is an isomorphism, where again, in my case, the dimension of the local Hilbert space is equal to two, and where the total Hilbert space of the chain is given by the product over the whole chain of the individual Hilbert space on each side. And I'm looking for an L operator which satisfies the uh, young buster equation, which again, I found before, and this time I write it in a slightly different way for convenience later. So sigma j a, uh, sigma a z tau a z over two plus t lambda one minus sigma z a tau, mm, tau a z plus r of lambda sigma j plus tau a minus plus sigma j minus tau a plus where t is b lambda divided by a lambda and r is c lambda divided by a lambda and i use i mean it's essentially the same amount of information but i want to denote the parameters of the two matrices differently because a priori they can be functionally different and because it is convenient for uh, development purposes uh, to keep this uh, this distinction. So now I have this L operator, and I want to construct my monodromy matrix by multiplying this L operator. But remember, the monodromy matrix is done by multiplying only in the ancillary space. So it is convenient, instead of seeing this as a four by four matrix, to see it as a two by two matrix in which each entry acts on a two dimensional space. So I like to see, uh, to look at the L operator as a two by two matrix in ancillary space in which each entry acts on the physical space. So in particular, this I can write.
as 1 plus tau lambda over 2 plus 1 minus tau lambda over 2 sigma j z r lambda sigma j minus r lambda sigma j plus and 1 plus tau lambda half minus 1 minus tau lambda half sigma j z. As a side note, I point out that this, the form of this scattering matrix has a natural interpretation as the scattering so that uh, this lowers one spin of the physical Hamiltonian, which means that the auxiliary spin has been raised by one, and this is the vice versa, while these instead are uh, instances in which the spin has not been uh, turned, so in which the spin has been uh, conserved between in each space. And now I take the product of the transfer matrix as product of two by two matrices, and which so I construct the monodromy uh, matrix, which will remain two by two matrix in auxiliary space. Because I'm just taking a product, the traditional matrix product of two by two matrices, but in which each of the entry will be an operator acting on an enlarge and enlarge uh, Hilbert space. So by taking the product of L1 uh, A lambda 2 A lambda dot 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 L and A lambda, this remains formally a 2 by 2 matrix, but in which each of these A, B, C, and D operator act on the whole Hilbert space. So A, B, C, D act on the Hilbert space or isomorphism in the total Hilbert space, so a space of dimension uh, 2 to the n. So definitely one thing, okay, I, mean, I have the problem of diagonalizing my Hamiltonian, which was an operator in the total Hilbert space. Now I saw I reduced it to a problem of four operators in total Hilbert space. Moreover, the Hamiltonian at least was local. Here I have no notion of locality. If I start writing out the ugly mess that comes out of this, what, uh, what have I done? What have I accomplished? Well, okay, what you, re you really want to do is you want to find eigenstates of the transfer matrix, where the transfer matrix is the trace over A of the monodromy matrix, so you want to find eigenstates of A lambda plus D lambda. So at, formally you only have to diagonalize these two, but Still, good luck. So what is the great idea? Well, the great idea is that you have a very non-trivial uh, knowledge of uh, what these A, B, C, and D operators do because your monodromy matrix satisfies the yam buster equation. So again, you can spell out this equation in terms of the operators. This time you have to be a bit more careful because uh, you're not treating C numbers, but you're treating operators, so they don't uh, commute. But this gives a series of non-trivial relations between A, B, C, and D, a different point in the spectral uh, parameters, 
with uh, the which are related by the R matrix. So this is why I keep these coefficients separate because I want to keep the operators and the algebra essentially uh, separated. So the algebraic approach says that, okay, let, let's not look at the form of the operators on what they look like, but let's treat them just as operators with a particular algebra. And so this young bastard equation gives me a generalized algebra so that, for instance, this tells me what happens if I take first I multiply A by B at different points, how is the commutation relation between this? What will happen? So typically expressions that you get is that A lambda B mu is equal to F of mu minus lambda B mu A lambda plus G lambda minus mu B lambda A mu. So these are generalized commutation relations which are given by this and you have a bunch of them and therefore you trade the knowledge of what these operators look like for their action. Then the next uh, realization <coughs> is that as here I commented that this L operator has an interpretation of a scattering matrix in terms of which, for instance, this element corresponds to the fact that one spin up of the chain has been, uh, that spin up at that particular point has been uh, turned down and uh, at the same time the horizontal spin has uh, flipped in the opposite direction. This is true also for these operators. So this transfer matrix has a natural interpretation in the same form of the L operator as 1 plus A lambda tau, uh, I mean, yeah, tau A Z plus uh, 1 plus D lambda tau A Z over, well, okay, let me just... do it in a different way. So if I inject uh, um, my system with a spin A and I extract the auxiliary space with the spin down, this gives me B of lambda. So these components are the scattering event of a spin chain, of the event of sending my uh, auxiliary space through the chain and scattering it with the chain as a whole. So I lose the knowledge of what happened locally inside the chain, but I look at the chain as an object in which my auxiliary space has scattered and has left some of its quantum number or it has modified the chain. So the way that I proceed to construct the state, yes, I'm afraid that, sorry, I'm trying to rush, <clears throat> is to look for an easy state, which is called the pseudo vacuum, which is defined by the property that is an eigenstate of the transfer matrix. With some, with some eigenvalues. And which is annihilated by all the C. So this is a natural interpretation because if this corresponds to a scattering event in which a spin has flipped down, this is a scattering event in which the spin has flipped up. So you look for a state that morally has all uh, spin up. In fact, for this chain, this is exactly the state you're looking at. You're, you find that you can prove that the such state that has satisfy 
this property is exactly the completely polarized ferromagnetic uh, state looking up. And you can prove it because um, if you calculate the action of the black operator on such state, this matrix becomes um, uh, diagonal, uh, triangular, and so also the lux, uh, the modular matrix becomes uh, triangular, and therefore that state is an eigenstate, and then you can uh, prove that uh, this condition is also is also true. So this is a state with all spin up, and we have this interpretation that instead B flips one spin up in down, but of course it does not uh, flip a particular spin of the chain. It flips one, I mean it changes the magnetization by one in the whole chain in a very non-local way, but it is natural to look for typical eigenstates in a sector with R magnons as the product of a sequence of B operators acting on this vacuum. So you start from the vacuum, you act with the B, and that progressively lowers the magnetization. And then you're looking under which condition it is true that T lambda uh, C is equal to lambda lambda C, if that can be done at all. And how you do that? Well, T is A of lambda plus D of lambda. And so you do it in the same way as you construct eigenstates if you have a uh, harmonic oscillator or if you have uh, a field theory plus perturbation when you have a coherent state. You know that the vacuum is an eigenstate of this. So you progressively commute A and D through the Bs until eventually they hit your, uh, your state, and at that point uh, you have gotten rid of this part of the operators. Of course, through the commutation, as you see here, additional terms will be generated. And the question is, can you find an easy way to set to zero all the non-diagonal terms? And the and the, the answer is positive. If you do it by brute force, it's not going to be easy to see. Uh, it's, uh, it's better if you look at the equations and you think about it a little while, and especially if you use the symmetries of the problem. For instance, you can prove that quite luckily the Bs commute with one another, which means that the order in which you apply these creation operators uh, does not matter, which means that throughout the computation you have this uh, symmetry and that helps you uh, avoid in doing calculations which amount uh, to zero because every time you produce something that is anti-symmetric it means that you eventually will be killed. But anyway, I don't have the time to show how it is done but I don't think that you will be surprised in uh, finding out that the result of this procedure is that if that this state is an eigenstate of the transfer matrix, if the, the eigenvalues, oh sorry, this was supposed to be a D, D of lambda divided by A of lambda is equal to the product J, uh, J, J, L different from J to R of F of lambda J minus lambda L, F of lambda L minus lambda J, which when you spell it explicitly are the beta equation for the xx z chain. So you have, of course, complete consistency between the two approaches. But 
The great advantage is that in this way you construct your eigenstates as a product of n terms, or r terms, which are the number of quasiparticles that you have, and not as a product, as a uh, sum over an exponential number of permutation that grows with, with r. <clears throat> but at this point you have not gained much because you have just identified the eigenstates, you have the beta equation, so you have not done anything better than what you could do with the coordinate approach. But at this point you can start asking questions like how do, do I calculate um, uh, expectation values of local observables? So clearly if you just try to do this, calculate just a magnetization at a particular point of your chain, you're kind of dead in the water because your knowledge of these states is just given in terms of this uh, creation uh, of these operators. So you need to be able to re-express something local like an operator that you're interested in, in terms of these operators in order to use the algebra that allows them uh, to commute. And you can do it. So you, can, you have formulas like the fact that sigma z j is equal to the product from L from 1 to j minus 1 of A plus D times A minus D times the product from L from J plus 1 to N of A plus D. There are some subtleties here about uh, the value of the spectral parameter, which I'm, I'm skipping because I don't have time uh, to, uh, to explain. But you see that Something very simple, I, the expectation value of the magnetization involves a product of n operators, which as uh, the system size grows, it's a lot. And then you have to plug them here and then commute them, and each commutation generates additional terms. So typically you still have an exponential number of terms as a result of this process. But you can be smart, and there have been a lot of smart people in this world, and uh, you can find uh, structures in, uh, in this exponential number of terms which allow you to come to a semi-close uh, form. But of course, I'm not, I don't have the time to get there. I, one thing that I would like to mention is that even before you get to this point, you might have noticed that when I wrote even in the coordinate representation the wave function, I had a sum of, uh, of plane waves. But what you should do with that? Is that a reasonable eigenstate? Say that I, say that I consider a simple case. I just have two... Uh, particles and I take that superposition of eigenstate and I want to calculate the magnetization. Can I just take that wave function, plug in the expression for the sigma x and calculate it? There was one important piece missing in the two body uh, wave function which is for theory missing in an n body wave function. Anybody? You know, we often forget when we are look we are writing something like this to always make sure that this is normalized. Because we take as an assumption that you always work with normalized states. 
But the beta state that I constructed in the coordinate representation had a big constant in front, which it's a very complicated problem to begin with, because if you want to calculate the normalization factor, you still have to sandwich all those plane waves. And although sandwiching plane waves is simple, but you have an exponential number of those. And so it's a hardly non-trivial problem. And as it turns out, even uh, this state is a priori uh, not uh, normalized, and you want to make sure that it is. So that was Godin who first uh, tried to do it, and he could not do it by brute force. So he did it by even bruter force, by computing it uh, and plotting it. And so by going up to five or six uh, states, he conjecture the form of the norm of the wave function. It was a very good conjecture. It is true, but it was a conjecture that was supposed to be extrapolated for a large number of particles made out of a very small number of uh, state. And it took a long time to be able to prove it and to find the right way uh, to do uh, that calculation. That was definitely one of the goals of the St. Petersburg School that um, worked out the inverse scattering uh, method but it is only in the middle of the 90s that the proof was uh, hammered and, uh, and completed. And it is, again, a wonderful piece of mathematics, very, um, very neat as a proof, which I don't have time uh, to explain, but I uh, recommend uh, that you read about if you're, if you're interested in the subject. So I'm sorry I've been brief, but honestly, uh, given the time, I'm not sure how much more I could have uh, given because things get very complicated very quickly. So I hope that at least I provided some physical intuition and some uh, guide points for those who like uh, to go deep or that still just want to listen to talks and understand better what is going on. With that, thank you for your attention. Okay, Lib uh, linear model. Uh, we also have plane waves, but those are actual particle plane waves with coordinates, etc. But there too, you have the Young-Baxter equation to make sure that these plane waves will be a solution for the models that you consider the spin models. Can we see the same thing that we can calculate the scattering, say, of those two spinons and see that this will satisfy the scattering young Baxter equation as opposed to the operator one? Or, or you did that and I was asleep? No, no, I think that this is essentially that this L uh, operator is okay. But... Sorry, I don't understand. Un un uh, you start with uh, two spinons, two elementary excitations that scatter uh -huh. of each other. So that will be, again, some of the plane waves in that case. But uh, there will be uh, phases. Uh, yeah, no, I, this is, I did yesterday when I constructed uh, uh, the beta wave function in the coordinate representation. And, and you mentioned, I guess, while I was asleep that uh, yeah, these, these uh, phases satisfy the scattering by Giax, by, Bang Yaxter. <laughs> Young Buster, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I did not mention uh, the Young Buster at the point, at the time, but yeah, that is uh, indeed the case. More questions? You did compare to the asymptotic Betianzat case uh, here. Uh, <coughs> the, in that framework, the Young Buster is trivially uh, satisfied because it's already uh, decoupling set of two body uh, processes. So the only non-trivial part is here to when you embed it into a matrix formalism, that, that, that becomes, but the, the, the phase itself, it's trivial a bit like for the lib linear. More questions? 
Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank uh, Fabio Franchini for a nice set of lectures.